Welcome everyone. Hope uh, you had a good day. We were just commenting that uh, it's been a great day to be out in our gardens. Um, we were all excited today to see a bird we'd never seen before. We had the uh, scarlet tanager here. We were pretty excited about that. Um, I have a few items uh, that I've made a list before we uh, start with our speaker. Hopefully everyone received their newsletter today. Again, thanks Jacqueline, it was wonderful. And thanks to the various members who uh, wrote articles and sent pictures. Hope everyone takes time to read it. There's uh, lots of reminders and very likely, or we have decided that this will be our last newsletter until the fall. We've also um, received results from the survey. Uh, as you might remember, uh, Jacqueline sent out a survey and I think 39 respondents. And so we received some good ideas for uh, speakers or for topics. So that'll give us a good base to work from uh, when we start again in the fall. I contacted Jennifer Glenn. She was our guest speaker uh, at the last meeting. She has the business, I never know what the right order is. This is it, pick, plant, prune. And she also uh, is putting in the big community food garden. And it's progressing as she had hoped, expected. She hopes in a few weeks, um, it'll be ready to start putting in the planting, plantings. And if anybody wants to volunteer to help, she can be contacted. Just look up her name, Jennifer Glenn, pick, plant and prune. Or if you have any questions, she says, uh, just let, uh, share them, ask her about that. Junior program, um, there's business that sort of goes on behind the scenes. Uh, Laura is our leader and she has 18 um, children registered. One thing we did was we ordered native uh, perennials from Ferguson uh, Tree Nursery in Kentville. And uh, they're going to be, some of them anyway, given to the uh, kids for uh, pollinator gardens. And uh, her plan is this year with the uh, kids to um, use the three sisters idea, the uh, crop model from um, the indigenous people, where you plant um, corn, squash and beans. So uh, it's uh, rolling out and uh, when we get the plants the end of May, we should get the plants and then everything will be distributed to the kids. And then there's a um, number of things that are ongoing. Um, and if, um, yeah, nothing new, things seem to progress slowly with COVID, um, for example, getting together for the planting at the museum. We haven't gotten together, haven't heard back from Township about their community garden. Um, we did give bursaries to um, high school students. Um, Marilyn, I see her nodding. Marilyn has been our contact and uh, that was uh, organized, we'll um, organize to the upkeep of uh, the library, McDougal Park. I'll speak to some of you whether we should be planting at Russell Meadows this year or if that's off, but anyway, there's some things that uh, we'll have to uh, establish or that will slowly unfold uh, during the summer. Now, I had hoped Manya, is she on, Jacqueline? I don't see her on here. Okay. Manya is our lady in charge of the rain barrel sales. And I'd hoped for an update, but maybe uh, it can all be done via emails because it's uh, this week that they were to be delivered to their place and they are um, 
the schedule is for this Saturday for pickup. So we shall see and you'll get details as they become available. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Has Peggy arrived, uh, Jacqueline? No, I don't see her name either. Okay, then I will introduce our guest speaker. We're fortunate and pleased to have Nancy McDonald as our guest speaker. And uh, Nancy grew up in PEI, uh, learned at an early age to enjoy gardening. Uh, parents, grandparents, um, good examples. She has had a career in nursing and uh, now in retirement has become a master gardener and does uh, presentations and enjoys puttering, I'm sure, in her own gardens. And we're pleased to have her this evening uh, as our guest speaker. Welcome, Nancy. Thank you so much. I will share my screen now, uh, hopefully, I've got permission to do that, Jackie. Uh, you just have to give me permission to uh, share. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk tonight about um, things I do, things I enjoy doing with herbs and edible flowers uh, from my garden. And um, it started kind of simply, I, I had seen a recipe for lilac jelly. And that sort of led me down the garden path of what was growing in my garden and what I might be able to, to do with some of my flowers. And I've always enjoyed herbs because uh, they can add so much flavor and uh, interest to your meals. So just this first picture was a salad I had made from my garden. And I thought when I went out that morning, I just had greens. And then I realized, no, I had um, uh, daylily petals. I had calendula petals. I had borage flowers. Tucked in here is even a dill flower. And it's just a timely reminder that that we can eat a lot of the flowers that come with our, our herbs. So visual attractiveness for sure. Um, we eat with our eyes, that's one of our senses and um, quite an enjoyable salad. So this was uh, something I had seen on one of those um, shows on television where there were some chefs and they were showing a very simple idea um, of taking just some flowers and some herbs, a soft cheese like a goat cheese and uh, rolling them uh, in, in those herbs, putting it on a, a plate with some crackers or something and uh, taking it to like a summer potluck and people would think it's almost like the making those rice crispy squares, which are so simple. People would think, wow, how did they do that? And it was just so simple. So even though I enjoy being in my kitchen, I really also enjoy um, making a bit of an impact, but maybe uh, not that difficult to do. So some of the things I'm going to share with you tonight certainly are not difficult to do. So let's start with edible flowers, some do's and don'ts. Um, if you can grow your own, that is the best. That's what I enjoy doing because then I can, I can grow, use organic seeds and, and plants. And I know that uh, I'm not consuming any chemicals. Make sure children know uh, to check before uh, eating for sure. Educate yourself on which parts of the plant are edible and positively identify the plant Latin name and all. And I've given you on the handout on edible flowers, I gave you two uh, good references. One was uh, the University of Minnesota and one was West Coast Seeds. 
and they they will give you lists of edible flowers. Also, which parts of the flower? Maybe you can have the petals. Maybe you can eat the leaves or the stems. Maybe you can even eat the roots. So I've never really dug up a, a flower to do that. And just a reminder that, you know, don't put anything on the plate if it's not edible, for sure. Um, there's quite a history to edible flowers. Uh, the Chinese incorporated flowers as ingredients way, way back, 3,000 years BC. The Romans used things like mallow and fennel and alpine pinks, violets, roses, and lavender, all things we can grow. And it was amazing when you read some of the history, um, how some of the how the Romans would have brought some of the flowers, but also some herbs also to, to uh, England, British Isles. The large blossoms from squash and pumpkin have a long history among indigenous peoples. Uh, rose petals, orange blossoms used in Greek, North African, and Indian cuisine. And of course, edible flowers were very uh, popular in Victorian era because they, they, had, they put a meaning to many of the flowers and they used them in communication. But there are health benefits. Um, they're pretty, but there's also health benefits. So when we think of herbs, we think of antioxidants in like oregano, sage, peppermint, lemon balm, and one teaspoon of oregano contains as much antioxidants as three cups of broccoli. Oregano, thyme, and rosemary are classified as super herbs. And anytime you use and cook with herbs, you increase the flavor. And if you increase the flavor, you probably can cut down on the amount of salt and sugar and fat. And that's all from um, the University of Michigan, their Health Institute, those facts on herbs. You have to look a little farther to find um, information about, about flowers, but, but it is there. There are flowers with high mineral contents, your chrysanthemums, um, uh, violas, uh, dianthus, uh, polyphenols, and, and um, high antioxidant capacity was found among 10 common edible flowers in China. And you can go to the new, uh, US Department of Agriculture. They have a nutrient database for some of the edible flowers. Um, but there are things like vitamins A and C, these are in edible flowers, riboflavin, niacin, minerals such as calcium and phosphorus, iron and potassium, um, the phytochemicals, as I've already mentioned, which are just natural substances in plants, so both in herbs and flowers, and pigments that make um, roses red, nasturtiums orange, are rich in polyphenols, so we said. So there are some health benefits uh, that we may not even really consider when we're thinking of, of using um, flower, flowers in particular. And when I'm talking about cooking with herbs, I'm just talking about the small amounts that are usual in recipes. I'm not talking about using herbs as medicine. I don't have any um, expertise or knowledge of that. So I'm just talking about your regular um, amounts that you would be adding. Um, it's very, flowers have been very um, big in, in decorating cakes, cupcakes, et cetera, for special occasions. And this was Harry and Meghan's um, wedding cake. And uh, it had elder, elder uh, flower syrup, elder flower buttercream uh, for, this, for the icing, uh, 150 flowers, including peonies and roses. So um, I don't know whether they would have put a piece in the freezer to eat um, anniversaries or not, but it's pretty, pretty nice looking. So these are the herbs and edible flowers that I grow and use in my kitchen. And I, I'm not going to be talking about each one tonight, but, you know, basil and, and bay. I take my bay tree in every fall. Uh, it's been going back outside now during the day, and I've left it out overnight in a shaded area. Just um, it'll soon stay out completely. 
cardamom ginger was a new uh, herb to me last year and um, it grew into a lovely, lovely large um, house plant that I've taken inside, lovely foliage. When I'm close to it, it, it is a ginger, uh, but it has that cardamom scent. Um, I can use the leaves in tea. So it's been nice and it's beautiful foliage plant in my house. So that was a good one. Chives, of course, cilantro, which I'll mention later, dill, which I'll mention later. A new one for me this year is Good King Henry herb. Um, it's supposed to, I've uh, just planted it. It's supposed to, uh, the leaves are uh, spinach like. And I'm hoping that I'll be able to freeze the greens and use them in, in soups and that. So we'll see how good Henry, uh, King Henry comes along. Um, lemon balm and lemon verbena and lovage. Mint, and I do have a spearmint that comes back every year. I grow it in a pot in the ground. But then I try different mints. And this year I have, for the second year, Hillary's, um, Hillary Lemon Mint which was named after Hillary Clinton, I guess. Uh, and it was quite a nice, um, quite a nice um, mint last year that I used in teas. And I, I also uh, this year am having pear mint. Um, the leaves smell wonderful on the plant. So I'm hoping to dry that as well for the winter. Oregano, parsley, rosemary, sage. I have salad brunette, savory, which I'll talk about later. Sweet Sicily, which I'll talk about tarragon and thyme. And the flowers that I use mainly uh, because I grow them are borage, um, calendula, daylilies. Uh, the garlic skate flower is, is really a flower of the garlic, so I count, count as a flower. Lavender lilac, nasturtiums, peony, and violas. I'm hoping if my, if my dianthus does well this year that I'll actually do something with it, but um, that's, that's another possibility. So what I do with my herbs, uh, certainly I dry lots, I freeze. Uh, this is just some samples. Um, for some of the herbs uh, like parsley and sweet sicily, I will uh, roll them almost like a log, like you see in the top here and, and freeze them to um, uh, just, it just makes it easy when I'm taking them out of the freezer, I can just take a sharp knife and, and, uh, and sort of easily take off what I need in small bits. I make all kinds of pestos. Anything that's almost green in the garden, I will try to make some pesto with it. Even my radish leaves went in with my basil last year to make pesto, so, um, and then I just freeze that. So lots of things in that way. So basil, I'll just talk about it a bit. It's a, it's a great companion plant with tomatoes. Um, I use it in pesto, bruschetta, pizzas. Um, I also like it in, in, in salads, of course. And then last year I saw that you could make it into jelly. So I, I decided to, um, to try some. I use that jelly more as a glaze on um, like pork, uh, chicken. Um, will I make it again? It wasn't one that I used as much as some of my other jellies, so no, but I, uh, you know, I always like to try things to see if, uh, if I will uh, do it again. Just in this picture, it isn't, um, uh, it, it's just those little cucumelons. I don't know if any of you grow those little ones. Um, I, I didn't enjoy the taste that much off the vine, but I used a dill pickle recipe with them, and I'm definitely doing that again. They, they would just, they're just great uh, if you were, whenever we can entertain again, they would be really nice on a charcuterie board. Borage is one of my favorite little flowers in the garden because I love the blue colors. It's got that mild uh, cucumber flavor. Uh, it does mean courage, uh, and they is that the ancient warriors did drink a tea uh, before they went into battle. Um, you almost know it's ready to pick. So if you take the, if you just give a, a little tug here, I call it almost on its beak, uh, and it just pulls away easily. Then it's it's ready for you to um, to use. 
So I use it in salads, as you saw. It's beautiful as a garnish. Just think if you had a nice uh, fruit salad in the summer, you could uh, just sprinkle some of those borage flowers over and it would look so pretty. The leaves can be steamed like spinach and just in teas or lemonade to, to float. Now, if you plant borage, um, you will always have it because it does self-seed. I don't find that's a big problem. Uh, I, I like it, the pollinators like it, but if you've got too many seedlings in one spot, what I've done sometimes is just uh, pot them up and uh, you know, have them have the borage uh, on a pot on, on, my, on my deck and uh, I can watch the pollinators enjoying the flowers. So very pretty flower. Um, calendula, it's called poor man's saffron. It's got a flavor depending on your tongue. Is it spicy? Is it bitter? Is it tangy? Um, the petals will add that yellow tint to food and flavor as well. I didn't put that blue line there, but let's see if it dis disappears. Hmm. I don't know where that blue line came from. I didn't draw. Anyways, so calendula, I use fresh, but I also use it, um, I use it dried and I don't have any fancy drying equipment uh, at home. I just use a cotton tea towel and um, I, uh, I just turn it over until the flowers are dry, almost until they feel like straw. And then you can, uh, I'm just gonna see if I can get rid of this ink thing. Nope, I don't know. I didn't put the blue there, but it's there. So I'm just gonna go back just a second. So for drying it, um, then I just, after I, it feels almost a flower straw like I will put them in a, a jar a mason jar and add them to calendula is wonderful with um, any of egg dishes like omelets and frittatas you can even add it to biscuits when you're you're cooking it or muffins uh, this was just a sort of all in the pot uh, soup it's got everything in it and it's too bad I didn't take a picture before uh, because um, it wasn't this sort of yellow tinge and that's what the calendula did to it. So cilantro and coriander. Now I'm one person that really enjoys uh, cilantro and the flavor of it. Um, I guess, what is it about maybe 15 or 20% of the population when they taste cilantro, it tastes like soap. But for me, I really enjoy it. Uh, cilantro is the leaves, coriander are the seeds. Uh, it's very, very ancient herb. The, the seeds of coriander were found in Egyptian tombs. Um, the, the leaves can be dried or frozen or used in oils or vinegar. Now, a lot of people, the reason they don't like to grow cilantro is because it bolts. As soon as the warm weather comes, like days like today, if you had it out there, it would go to flower. Um, I've been growing now for three years. It's a slow to bolt and you can cut it and it'll come again. Um, cilantro seeds called Calypso. Um, there, you can see them in a lot of the seed catalogs. I haven't seen them locally in nurseries, but at Richter's or West Coast Seeds or Bessie's, uh, I've certainly seen, seen them. So I will start my seeds probably in the next few days outside. And I probably don't have to seed again until maybe the end of July. I'll start another, um, uh, so it'll go later in the season, but I can cut up to about three times before it will bolt and go to um, flower. So it's a, it's a good one. If you like cilantro, that's a good variety to grow. I make a chutney with it. Um, I've also made pesto with it. The chutney is just a little thinner, a little runnier. I just froze it. Um, quite nice, uh, you know, almost like a dipping um, on, a, on, a, on a platter. So it was, it was quite nice. 
I'm always looking for recipes, you know, it's, it's amazing now that we can Google what you will find. So daylilies, uh, most of us do grow daylilies. Um, and this is where it's really important to know the proper name because daylily is hemorrhalis, right? But some people will shorten the name to lily. They'll refer to Asiatic lilies, day lilies, they'll just all be lilies. Well, the hemorrhalis, the day lily, is perfectly edible for us, but Asiatic lilies, tiger lilies, they, they could be toxic. So that's why it's really important to, to know. The um, lighter colored ones will be less astringent in, in flavor. Uh, the culinary use, um, you can use the buds and traditionally they're used in Chinese stir fries and Japanese tempura. The buds in hot and uh, sour soups. The petals are used in soups and salads and sorbets. I just took this picture off um, Google just for a different idea of where they've taken the, the buds here and they've made them into daylily fritters. And you can also stuff the flowers. So what can you eat with daylilies? Well, Steve Brill was on Home and Garden TV. They call him Wild Man Steve. He had uh, once been arrested, I think it was in the 80s, for eating, um, uh, eating a dandelion in, in New York um, Central Park. So he, he says, you know, you can harvest the tender shoots, um, use them in stir fries, pastas, put them in a salad. Um, the open, large unopened flower buds can be used in recipes and they sort of taste like green beans. And then the flowers, you know, it's, it's just, to me, it's, it's lovely. And, you know, I can't believe that for years I never even thought of, of eating some, uh, something like some of these flowers. Um, and the thing about daylilies is some people that have food for us do include daylilies because, uh, you know, you can, you can eat them in so many different ways. Dill, um, I direct sow those seeds as well. And the seeds I use are compata, compato because I grow them in a container. I think if you've grown dill in the ground, then it probably has self-seeded for you as well. Uh, it's an excellent companion plant to cabbage. Of course, it's in the same family as carrots or fennel, so you want to uh, not have it close to them. The leaves can be fresh or frozen. The seeds dry, and I, I dry some seeds. Um, great for pickles, vinegars, and cheeses. I show you the picture of the black swallowtail caterpillar on here because I'm always most interested if I see these come in my parsley or my dill. And I have enough plants that I can certainly share because that's a beautiful butterfly and you're sort of hoping they'll come to a butterfly before the birds um, pick them off. But I always like seeing them. Just a reminder again that dill and cilantro flowers both have an intense flavor. So any, anywhere in a recipe you were going to use dill or cilantro, you can, you can use their flowers. Um, so great in salads and so forth. Uh, just think of chive flowers too, you know, we, we uh, um, usually cut up the greens and chives. Maybe we use the, I, I've certainly made uh, vinegars with the flowers to get the pretty color, but just taking those chive blossoms and sprinkling some of them over a, a soup will give you that, um, that onion flavor as well. So garlic scapes, which is the flower bud of the garlic. Uh, my garlic is just going gangbusters this year. It's just, I can't believe how, how big it is already. I think I'm going to have a much earlier harvest. Um, I used to always uh, use them in stir fries. I know some people pickle the uh, garlic scapes. But my favorite thing to do with it is to make pesto. And my granddaughter loves this pesto. If she's making a chicken sandwich or something, she will add the pesto to it. It's, it's, really, it's really great. 
Um, I should tell you <clears throat> maybe before, maybe I'll just go back there for a second. Um, I have, I told my grandson one night he was coming over, I said, it was in the winter and I said, I'm going to make you a five minute meal just to tell him that I could. And uh, so what I did is um, I, I put some boiling water, of course, over couscous. So, you know, that's going to be ready really quickly. And I had already thawed some of my garlic skate pesto, but I just uh, started the frying pan with uh, and added my shrimp to it. Um, and then just added in some of my garlic um, pesto and put that over my couscous. And that was like my five minute meal. So, you know, you can do something pretty quickly sometimes. Lavender. So the ones that grow best in our climate are the English types, Hidcote or Munstead, um, and cut back the plants in spring. I've, I've done that now. Uh, if you're going to dry it, you have used it in the winter and dry, dry it in the warm, airy location. And if I'm, if I'm picking any herbs or uh, to, to dry, I usually pick them in the morning uh, before the, the heat of the sun has burnt off some of the oils on the leaves. And um, I just have a, sh a shed outside that I can dry them inside. Um, you can use the flowers in custards or ice cream. But one of the simplest things to do is just to sprinkle a few of those little flowers over something like chocolate cake or ice cream. Uh, and um, you just need a little bit because you don't want lavender to over whelm the flavor, but it looks so pretty. Uh, you can preserve it in sugar, in honeys. And I did give you some idea, I think, on the herb handout of which, which um, herbs are good for, for sugars. I'm hoping to make some honey this year with my lavender. Um, and then I'm thinking I might use that honey. I've seen some recipes online for lavender honey, maybe on chicken, roast chicken or so forth. So I'm going to try it anyways. Um, I've made rosemary honey and it, I think it'll be fine, not too, not too hard to do. So I was giving a talk at the Home and Garden Show on herbs and uh, someone in the audience said to me, have you ever made a lavender tea cake? And she runs a bed and breakfast outside of the city of Ottawa. And she sent me this recipe then. And in this, I minced um, a few of the leaves, uh, the quantity that it said, very dense, heavy, almost like a pound cake. And um, just added the, the lavender flowers as decorations. Quite a nice cake, actually. She serves it at her bed and breakfast, and I can see it probably would be a winner. I was giving a talk at the Friends of the Farm lecture, and that's always a long, um, you know, it's, it's almost an hour and a half to two hours, and you have a break in between. So because I was talking about herbs and edible flowers, I thought I'd better take them something um, to try. So in the in the top um, picture, I have um, it's a, a lavender shortbread cookie that I found just allrecipes.com, and it had lavender in it, it had mint in it, and lemon zest. Lovely buttery cookie, but I didn't get much of a flavor of lavender. Um, so then I googled again. And I got Dame Mary Berry. If any of you have watched the Great British Baking Show, you'll know that Dame Mary Berry was on there. And this was her lavender biscuits uh, in the lower one. And I learned from her that if I was making any baking with um, herbs, I should cream my herbs with the butter so that the oil from the herbs comes into the butter and gives that flavor. So that's what I did. I could get more of a lavender, not an overpowering lavender flavor because that would just be too sweet, right? Or, or too, almost I think soapy in my mouth, but quite a nice uh, flavor with those. Um, and so I've used that tip of hers. I don't know how many of you enjoy the Farm Boy Lemon Thyme Loaf. It's one of my favorites. So I thought, well, I've got a nice lemon bread recipe. I will just cream uh, with my, my butter some of my thyme from my garden and um, it turned out pretty good as well. So 
just a tip if you're baking with, with herbs. Lemon verbena is probably, oh, I love this herb in the summer. Um, some people overwinter it. I haven't had it. It hasn't done well in my house over winter, but I, you just need one plant and you get that little seedling and you want to put it in at least a 12 inch pot because look how big it gets. And the thing about most of these herbs and edible flowers is the more you pick them, the more it grows and, and comes for you. You can puree the, the leaves and add them to sauces. Really, uh, any place you were going to use lemon zest in a recipe, you could mince up and use the leaves. It's got the most lemon flavor of any herb. It's, it's just amazing. I just, in the, in the picture before with the um, uh, lavender cookies, that tea in the cup that looked pretty, um, pretty weak yellow is actually lemon verbena tea. So I'm just going back to that. Um, and at the end of the season, I, I had dried a lot of leaves, but then anything that was left over, a friend of mine who makes soap actually took it to uh, flavor her soap. So something I tried last year with it uh, for the first time was I, I picked up some apples, uh, you know, just those perfectly imperfect ones at the, at the store because I had seen this recipe for apple lemon verbena jelly. Now I love crab apple jelly and always make it. I had never really liked um, apple jelly that much. I found it a bit bland. Um, so I, when I found this recipe online, I thought, well, maybe I'll try this. So, so I did just, and you add really a, enough, almost adding lemon verbena leaves for taste. So it was quite, uh, it was quite good. It might be something that I would uh, make again. And then I do make teas or really, I guess they're to sings uh, because there's, uh, I use rosemary. Uh, here you see it right here, just um, a sprig of it uh, and just water that has ju just boiled and you've let it sit for a minute or two and then just pour that over um, the, the sprig of rosemary or you could do that with mint, uh, lemon verbena and mint together. I really enjoy lemon balm, which I often call lemon B-O-M-B, not lemon B-A-L-M, because of course we, it really, really spreads in your garden. Um, thyme and cardamom ginger, which is new to me. And then I just dry it and uh, put them in. Sometimes it's a mixture or sometimes it's just the lemon verbena. And I have them all winter. And when I open those uh, bottles in the winter, it's like a smell of summer. So it all started for me with lilac jelly, uh, sent me looking to see what else I could do. Um, the purple flowers will give the most vibrant color. Here I used um, petals from my, my friend. And then just down here, I just have a plain regular um, lilac. Um, so I just mix them um, and I just, Take, take the uh, blossoms off. You can use them in jelly, which I did. You can make a syrup. You can find recipes for wine, in sugars, in meringues. Um, I also found ideas for mixing them with cream cheese or yogurt to use as a dip or a spread. Once you go looking, and, and also the library is another spot that has books uh, with, uh, about edible flowers and, and recipes as well. There's just so much out there. So uh, on the handout from on edible flowers, I did give you the a basic flower jelly and that they all start with a tea. So you, you uh, pick your flowers, take them, um, clean them, uh, wash them, and then just add them to a mason jar and pour the boiling water over top. And you let that steep for 24 hours. Then you, um, then you strain it in the morning. And um, what, what is, I mean, lie, any of these jellies is a lot of sugar, right? It's almost the same amount of sugar as the same amount of, of liquid. 
but I, I tell myself I don't have jelly every day. And I, uh, when I have it, it's a small amount. So it's basically sugar and your liquid and lemon or lime juice and pectin. Um, and it turns this lovely rosy color. Uh, I find my lilac jelly, it's the only one that fades, it loses its color. It goes to almost like a pale yellow. And when you Google lilac jelly on, online, you usually find it in that pale yellow color. It's got a unique flavor. And I find every jelly I use uh, make, I'm using the same pectin and sugar and so forth, but they all have just a little different taste that uh, I can enjoy. So Lovage is uh, really a green giant. It's quite high in my garden already. It's uh, great at the back of the border, um, full sun. Um, it gets those lovely umbral flowers that the uh, pollinators like. It's got a celery-like flavor. I always add it to potato salad, to potato scallop. I add it in the winter to so many soups and um, potatoes and just whatever I'm making. Um, the leaves and, and, and the stems can also can be used. Um, and so I use it to flavor so many things um, in my garden. It's just a wonderful, I'm hoping a lot of you grow this uh, because it is just a wonderful carefree plant in the garden, but huge, it really gets big. Mint, so uh, if you have mint, you probably grow it in the pot in the, in the ground. I grow spearmint uh, that I have in a, in a pot in the ground. And I usually dig it up about every couple of years and replace the, the soil in that pot. And I always add some um, uh, compost in that to the, to the pot in, in, the, in the spring. So spearmint is usually savory, peppermint, we think of chocolate with peppermint, so mainly with dessert. Um, desserts, and like I've already mentioned to you, I grow some other mints uh, just as an annual and then dry the leaves for winter teas. Uh, you can dry it or freeze it. And there are many, many um, varieties of mint. Uh, when you go on to Richter's catalog or look at one of those herb catalogs. You're just, I'm always enticed to try something new. So this year for me, it's the pear, the pear mint. Nasturtiums, oh my goodness, I call nasturtiums an incredible edible because you know you can eat the petals, you can eat the leaves. Last year was the first time when I was doing a little bit of a cleanup of my pots and that in the garden, that I took the leaves that were left. I washed them, I spun them dry and I froze them and I used them in soups in the winter. So really, it's, it is really great. It's got that peppery, spicy flavor and um, a cross between a watercress and a radish is how it's described. Um, I use it to um, top salads, uh, soups. If you were taking a flatbread uh, or a pizza out of the oven, you could just put that on top. You can stuff them if you would like to do that. I use them in vinegars, in jelly. Um, and if you have variegated, the Alaska foliage looks good in salads. So at the end of the season last year, I had a lot of nasturtiums and I thought, oh, I'll make a, a small batch. And usually I make about four, four bottles of a jelly and some make their way to friends and that. My my 13 year old grandson liked the nasturtium jelly the best of all mine at the flavor and, and I liked it as well. So that's just giving an idea of how simple you could make some nibbles that was a, a Google picture with just pineapple um, and cream cheese and ham um, and it does look pretty on the platter that's for sure. So I did make nasturtium pesto. Um, one of our master gardeners, Edith, um, had told me that she had made it at one time. So um, I did. I found a recipe, actually Martha Stewart's recipe online. And it had quite an earthy flavor. You use more of the leaves, like about two thirds leaves to one third flowers. And, um, 
if I find sometimes it's a little strong or something, the flavor of pesto, I'll often add just lemon or lime juice just to um, oh, brighten it up a little bit. Parsley, um, I, I just use one as well because it's, it grows so large. Um, rich, moist, and well-drained soil it likes. But I was listening to Paul Zam at one time and he was talking about using parsley plants as an edging around the garden because it, it's bushy, it's pretty, that's for sure. Uh, so, so it is lovely. Most of us, uh, we will, we see the um, curly parsley, that's usually the one they use as a garnish. Uh, and then the, um, uh, the, the flat leafed one is the one that's more likely to be used in, in cooking and that. It can be frozen. Um, it's great in herb butters and you can put them in pestos. I even found a recipe for using it in a lemon curd. So once you go looking, it's just amazing all the uh, different ideas you get for what you can do with these herbs. So we've all heard parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, uh, Scarborough Fair. So I thought I was doing some reading last year and they talked about combining different herbs together. And I thought, oh, I think I'll, I'll do that because I like that flavor and it's nice with savory dishes. Uh, and I just added the nasturtiums to it because just to get the color. So you can see I had a golden um, sage, my, my rosemary, um, my nasturtiums there, my parsley, and my thyme is over here. Now, peony was an unusual edible for me. When I made the lilac jelly, I'm just checking my time. Okay, I still got time. Um, I certainly don't like the taste of the petals, you know, uh, and, uh, um, but when I, I had posted that I had made lilac jelly for the first time and a friend of my friend, said, oh, I've never heard of nasturtium, but I make peony jelly. So that sent me looking for the recipe. And I used the two type um, of uh, Festiva Maxima here and Lady Borden. Those are the two types I have growing in my garden. And um, yeah, it, it turned out quite nice. Uh, so even though I don't like tasting the petals, the peony, uh, I did enjoy the, the jelly. Rosemary, uh, it's, it's an herb that I put out in the summer and take in to keep uh, as a house plant in the winter. Uh, delicious as a tea, you saw how simply I did that. In vinegars, I'll show you a picture in a minute. I preserved it in honey to make a flavored butter. And in the herb handout, I've given you a link to um, Sweet Sicily tea biscuits, which I'm going to talk about later, and rosemary honey recipe uh, that I use to make um, uh, butter. So it, it's just a lovely, lovely herb uh, in marinades, in stews, and roasts. One of my favorite things to do in the summer when you have so many tomatoes, and I don't can tomatoes, I find if I freeze them, I don't even peel them, I cut them. If they're the little ones, um, I will cut them in half. The others I'll cut up with the same size. I just sprinkle them with um, olive oil and salt and pepper and probably rosemary, one of my herbs, and roast them. I'm telling you, I could eat the whole sheep pan myself. They're so good when they come out, but I, I freeze them and then use them in the winter. So rosemary just comes in so handy uh, in the kitchen, that's for sure. Now I'm a Maritimer, as you know, and if you're a Maritimer, uh, summer savory is probably what you have used for your stuffings when you're, uh, rather than sage. And when I moved here in 1990, in the fall uh, cooking, you know, the, the Thanksgiving turkey, I went looking for summer savory, couldn't find it. And any of my friends that grew up here said, oh no, we use sage. And then I was listening to Peter Zosky one morning on the radio that would have been in the early 90s. And he talked about the great um, turkey stuffing divide uh, as far as seasoning goes. And he talked if you were from 
the Quebec Ontario border east, you probably use summer savory in your, um, in your stuffing. And if you were from the Quebec Ontario uh, west in Canada, you probably used uh, sage. And I, I grow both and I've added both to stuffing since then. Um, so the summer savory is an annual. I grow it from seed. Uh, the winter is a perennial. And um, I've just added a new type of winter savory to my garden. I, I started the seeds in the winter and I planted it out and it's got a lemon flavor to the winter savory. So we'll see how that comes through. Um, so you can use the leaves fresh as needed, and, but I usually mainly dry it. Um, and as I say, I use it in my meat pies. I also add it to um, some of my potato dishes. Sometimes just if a dish is missing a little something, something, you know, I'll add summer savory. And it was, a, uh, it was an herb that um, uh, Virgil, who was an ancient poet, and he always, he kept beehives. He always had summer savory around for his bees. And, um, uh, oh, it, it, you know, the Romans used it as a salt substitute. So if you don't grow or use summer savory, it might be something that you would enjoy trying. Sweet Sicily, um, it's up now. It hasn't flowered yet, but it's a nice big size in my garden. Uh, it's got those pretty fern-like leaves, full sun or part shade, and you get those white flowers. Now, sometimes it turns people off when I say it's got an anise flavor. If you were, if you were rubbing over the leaf and, and you know, smelling the odor, you would get that anise smell. But I use it to sweeten stewed fruit like rhubarb to really cut down on the sugar. Um, I, I still add some sugar, but I, I've been increasing my, my uh, sweet Sicily minced up to, to for, for quite a few years now. And I really cut down on the sugar um, you'll find it a lot in British cooking, like if you go to some of the BBC British uh, sites, uh, you'll find it uh, there. And I use it in sweet Sicily tea biscuits. I'm trying to think exactly how much sugar goes in that recipe. Not that much, just four cups of flour, I believe, and I'm doubling it. Um, I made them already this spring, but I just can't remember how much sugar, but I've cut down on the sugar because I've added sweet Sicily and I don't get an anise flavor. So it's a, it's a wonderful herb. And there it is. I've made my sweet Sicily scones. Um, maybe we're having a, a break from working in the garden. I've got some lilac flower um, jelly there with it. And um, it's just, uh, just really a nice little treat. So I mentioned something about vinegars. So the one on the um, right here is lemon verbena leaves. I've got calendula flowers and that's in a white wine vinegar. And here on the left, I've got nasturtium flowers. Um, I've got rosemary sprigs. I think uh, you can sort of see it. So. No, get yeah, right here, rosemary and peppercorns. And that's in an apple cider vinegar. Now I just took this picture outside, but what I do once um, I've got my, my brew established is I put it in a dark cupboard um, I'll probably shake it every uh, two or three days. I'll leave it there for could be three weeks, four weeks, and then I'll strain it into um, a sterilized uh, bottle. I'm meticulous, you know, cleaning, and I sterilize these jars all before I use them. But these, I've made these now. Um, this will be my my fourth year for making these these vinegars, and they're favorites. I use them in. Um, for salad dressings, I use them in marinades. Uh, sometimes when I'm baking something, I'll just use it uh, if I need some vinegar. For some of my recipes, I'll just use the apple cider one. 
So very, very good and very easy to do. So just, I'm just gonna end by saying that if you start to enjoy um, edible flowers, you can um, call yourself a florophagia person. And um, I had to put a picture in here that had dandelions in it. I'm, I'm not someone that, that does things with dandelions. I have some in, in my lawn, a few, but you know, you can make jellies, you can make syrup. And if you were like my grandmother, you would make some wine with it. So that's, uh, that's what I have. So I'm just gonna see if you have any, any questions. Um, I'll stop the share and um, I see there's something in the chat. Oh, where can we find the handouts? So I think was Jackie, did you send them out with the newsletter? I, I had sent them to. Um... No, I didn't send them with the newsletter. They're posted on our, our website on Russell oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, so they're there. Check Good. There. Yeah. Yeah. And the one thing I, I meant to mention and I didn't in this is to be mindful of allergies and to know what, uh, you know, your flower, particularly what family it might be, because I, I was going to do a, a rolled cheese log for some friends that were coming over. And I remembered that one had quite a few uh, allergies, flowers, and uh, she was allergic to chrysanthemums and calendulas in the same family as chrysanthemums. So it's always good uh, to, to be mindful of allergies. Like so I don't know if there's any questions. <laughs> can I uh, can I ask you a question? Um, yes. You you mentioned when you're making tea, um, let it boil not too vigorously and then let it sit for a minute. Yeah. Well, I just don't like to take and put boiling water right over the. It's just like the hot sun would be on your herbs outside, you know. So I let it just. Um, you know, let it sit maybe for a minute or so and then pour it over. It's still going to be hot and I'm still going to have a nice, but I just don't want to um, maybe burn off the, the oils that are on the rosemary or the herb I'm using. So I'll get the flavor. Yeah, because I find often herb teas, they're just not as flavorful as I would like them to be. And if I let them steep longer or put too much in, then they're too strong. So it's hard to get, get it just yeah. right. And I use them also in iced teas, like I'll use my lemon verbena and mint and so forth and make iced teas with them as well. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the thing is, you can add a little bit more water or you can add more herbs. That's what I, I do, you know, because I have no particular recipe. I seem to go to the garden and pick up, you know, some mint, pick some lemon verbena and throw it into a pot and yeah. It's, it seems to work out. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Maybe I can ask a question if anybody does something maybe different with flowers or herbs that I haven't mentioned, because I, I like to learn from whoever I'm speaking to as well. When you talked about lavender, I recalled going to a um, place where they served lavender scones. Yes, yes. Very nice. Yeah, and just a little bit like that, but it is, it is the one that when you're making something with it, you would want to go on the, a little bit of the, um, yes, uh, lighter side because it can mm -hmm. overpower you. Linda said that she uses geranium flowers in salads. Yes, you know, there's just, there's just so many, like if you go to what the website on that hand at West Coast Seeds and that, I think you're just amazed at, you know, what might be grown in your garden and like what you might be able to use. And then you just start Googling and my goodness, the recipe ideas. Have you ever tried uh, hostas? I just heard that hostas are actually in the asparagus family. Yes, are... I haven't tried them, but um, Rebecca Last, who's one of our master gardeners, okay. she did um, uh, she did a presentation for Trial Talk Live on last week on um, edible 
and edimentals, she called them perennials. It was like hostas and different, it was just, it was really an amazing uh, talk. And, and I, I know that hostas are, uh, and the shoots are just coming up now. I guess if I'm going to try it, this is the time to do it, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I just have this picture of what your shelves must look like with all your preserving jars. Like the color yeah, is amazing. Yeah, I do take a picture because I do a lot of pickles. I mean, I grew up on a farm, right? And, you know, I always said when I moved to the city, I said, I, it's too bad I should belong to a women's institute somewhere, you know, where people still because I remember going to work at the general one day and I was making nine day pickles. And so I had mentioned to someone at the table, we were having a meeting. I said, oh, I, I you know, I, I poured boiling water over my nine day pickles or something before I came this morning, the crop. And one of the directors said, you, you still make pickles? Like it was just like, and, but I mean, last year, last year, everybody got into making pickles and preserving, right? Yes. Um, they, people were running out of like, where could they find mason jars, you know, because they were so it, it's amazing. I think COVID brought a lot more people back to the kitchen and back to gardening and exactly. You know, yeah. You know. One little thing that um, I always do is when I cook green beans, I always put some winter savory in. Yes. Uh, when I was growing up, my dad always did that. And you would even when they would freeze the beans, they would put some winter savory in the package so that when you cooked it, you had that little flavor. Well, I'm going to try that. <laughs> I think that sounds good. I mean, I, I just, we didn't grow up with a lot of herbs like on Pete. Yeah, it was a very basic food, you know, growing up on the farm, it was meat and potatoes, lots of summer savory, mom would use onions and things. But I mean, I never even had spaghetti or pasta sauce until somebody moved in, you know, the Air Force Base was in Summerside and somebody moved in, it was the first time I had spaghetti, you know what I mean? I didn't grow up with all these flavors. So it's, it's just lovely to me to try new things. Is there anything you tried that you thought, oh no, I will never eat that again? Not so far, but I just take a little bite, I guess. Like, just like when I took it, when I saw peonies were and I took a taste of it, I thought I, I never want to taste that again. But in the jelly, it was good, you know, it, it, it really yeah. was. Um, I know one of my friends said she finds nasturtium leaves too, too uh, spicy in, in a salad. Um, but when I told her that I froze them and put them in soup, well, that sort of mitigates the, you know, it's not as strong then, but it's got all kinds of vitamins and that in, in it. So uh, she said, oh, I'll, that's what I'll do then, because she said I don't like them in salads. So, yeah. <laughs> If there are more questions, yes, no, then I would like to thank you, Nancy, and say it's been, uh, you say you like to have an impact. Well, you've certainly given us an impact. I didn't realize all the things you could do and uh, how uh, healthy they uh, were, the herbs, the flowers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe just plant one different thing I always say to people, well, what do you buy in herbs? You know, what's in your herb cupboard that you use? And is it something that you could grow, you know, and, and have both fresh and dry? So, and you know the price when you go to buy them, right? Expensive. Yes, and it's never as nice as when you've grown your own or get them yeah. fresh. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, it was my pleasure. Nice to meet yes. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.